Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May God's peace, mercy, and blessings be upon you, your families, this beautiful province, and this great country. We are honored to be hosting the premier, Jason Kenney, here and with the, the Justice Minister on behalf of the Al Rashid Mosque and the Muslim community. To start this program, inshallah, God willing, we will start with a prayer. I will translate it after reciting in the, from the Qur'an some verses. And then we will end with a prayer. And then we will be looking eagerly and looking anxiously forward to the words of our esteemed premier. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, all praise is due to Allah, God, the Lord of the worlds. The most compassionate, the most merciful, the owner of the day of reckoning. And unto him we ask, we worship, and unto him we ask for assistance. May he guide us upon the straight path, the path of those whom he has favored and not of those who have gained his anger and have been left astray. Amin, amen. We are here at the Al Rashid Mosque at a very difficult time. As we all know, the suffering of the Afzal family victims of a terrorist crime in London, Ontario. And we are very pleased that this province and the leadership of this province is taking the matter seriously and coming to the masjid, to the Muslim community and standing in solidarity. And I want to thank the Premier and the Justice Minister on behalf of the Muslim community for doing so. This is a time where we come together. This is a time where we stand together. And we must remember that the Afzal family was like any other family. They had a father, a mother, a grandmother, a beautiful 15-year-old daughter, and a young child, nine years old, who was still in critical condition. However, Islamophobia is not isolated to this one incident, but rather there is a pattern and there is an alarming pattern. I would like to end my talk with a prayer for them. A prayer for those who have fallen due to white supremacy. A prayer for those who have fallen due to white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism. A prayer for those who have yet to have their deceased ones even given the dignity of being named the 215 children who are still unnamed in the thousands of children who have yet to be named from the likely unmarked graves across this country. We have much prayer to do. We have much healing to do. And we have must, 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 much action to do. We have a lot on our hands and a lot on our plate, inshallah. Oh Allah, the most kind, the most merciful, the most just, we ask, Ya Allah, at this very moment, at this very place, and at this very time, we beseech you and implore you, implore you for your kindness. O oh Allah, with your divine hand and mercy and guidance, show us the way to healing. 
Show us the way to justice. Show us the way to understanding, peace and harmony. Oh God, the God that sees no difference in his creation except through their piety. We ask, oh Allah, illuminate our hearts, each and every one who resides in this nation. And let them be brothers and sisters. Let them be holding hand in hand, heart in heart. And let this country be a beautiful country, not a country that has been besmirched by hate and by besmirched by white supremacy. We ask, O oh Allah, in your goodness, in your love, to guide our leaders who have been bestowed the responsibility of bringing peace, justice, and goodness to not one Alberta, not one segment of Alberta, but to all Albertans and, and to all Canadians. I end with that and I ask you, O oh Allah, bless our Muslim community as well who are looking to heal. And the leadership of our Muslim community, the Al Rashid Mosque, and all of the mosques of this community, O oh Allah, we ask you, Rabbil Alameen, O oh Lord of the worlds, to bless us all in your kindness and goodness and illuminate all of this land with your love. Ameen. And I'd like to introduce the Premier and to invite him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum, good morning to you and everybody here from the Al Rashid Mosque who are joining us uh, for your welcome. Thank you to Noor Al Hanadi, thank you to uh, uh, Jim Abagush, Walid Zain, Basim Kadri, Omar Asif, and others from the community. I want to also thank Minister of Justice and Solicitor General uh, uh, Casey Madu and member of the legislature. Uh, Mickey Amory for joining me here today. Uh, we came here in part just on behalf of Alberta's government uh, to, in a personal and direct way, express our most profound condolences uh, to the entire Alberta Muslim community uh, following the terrible mass murder, hate crime, and act of terrorism against uh, members of the London Ontario Muslim community, the Afsal and Salman families. Thank you for opening us with uh, a prayer, Sayyidna. Uh, and we join our prayers to yours in praying for the souls of the four innocent people whose lives were so brutally taken simply because they were walking uh, in a park in a peaceable Canadian city on a nice spring evening. The notion that they were targeted uh, by a hateful individual simply because of who they were and of their faith, how they were dressed, because they were, they represented the other, uh, is a brutal reminder to us all uh, of the reality that many Canadians cannot completely take for granted their own security. And this is a national shame. It is one that we must all address. Alberta's legislature did so uh, in a motion expressing solidarity with the Muslim community, condemning this uh, brutal act of anti-Muslim violence and in rededicating ourselves uh, to, fight, to fight Islamophobia in all forms of hatred and bigotry. I was particularly moved in that debate in the legislature this week by a statement uh, from my colleague, uh, member of the legislature, Mohammed Yassin, who said that it was the family that had been targeted was a family just like his that looked like his, that prayed like him, and which was attacked while going for an evening walk, just as his family does every night. Uh, it underscored how this attack has affected Muslims all across Canada. And while we reach out in prayer and hope for the recovery of the young boy who has survived the attack, uh, we must uh, be moved by the notion that Muslims from every part of Canada uh, 
feel vulnerable, our neighbours, and I call on all Albertans to reach out to their Muslim friends and neighbours, and, and, and even if, if, if there are Muslims in your workplace, Muslims in your neighbourhood who you have never really gotten to know, now is the time to reach out to them, to get to know them, and just to wrap an arm around them and to show your personal support, to show your compassion, to suffer with them through this time of, of difficulty, of loss and of mourning. Uh, I pointed out in the legislature, in debate this week, that those who seek to, de to uh, make Muslims uh, somehow feel unwelcome in Canada do not know our own history. They certainly don't know our Alberta history, because in many ways, the history of Islam in Canada, it, the cradle of it is right here in Alberta, right here in Edmonton. This mosque, the Al-Rashid Mosque, where we are today, is uh, the descendant of the first mosque built in Canada in the 1930s, and the second, only the second mosque built in North America, right here, uh, by hardworking uh, Lebanese immigrants from the Bekaa Valley. One of the families who helped to build this mosque was the Shaban family, and the son of that family went on to become the first Muslim elected anywhere in Canada, anywhere in the British Commonwealth, and served in the cabinet of Premier Lougheed. The first Muslim elected to the Parliament of Canada was an Edmonton MP, Rahim Jaffer. The first uh, Muslim elected as a major city mayor in Canada is Calgary's Mayor Nahid Nenshi. The first Muslim vice-regal representative of the Queen is our own wonderful, honorable Salma Lakani. This Muslim community is not a new community. It is a community with deep roots of over a century in this province. It is a critical part of the fabric of this province, and we cannot allow anyone to tear that fabric apart. It is incumbent on all of us, of course, with words to denounce racism and hate-motivated viol hate violence whenever and wherever it occurs. But it is also incumbent upon us, especially on government, to act, to take real action, to make racial, religious, and vulnerable minorities feel safe and protected. And we must acknowledge that while the Muslim community, Muslims are often targeted for bigotry, and as we saw this week, even terrible violence, it is true that other minority communities are as well. And we stand in solidarity with them. Uh, Alberta's government is acting. Yesterday, Minister Madhu announced the creation of a dedicated provincial hate crimes coordination unit. This new unit will work in tandem, tandem with the community liaison to improve law enforcement efforts and achieve fair and just prosecutorial outcomes in hate crime, crime cases. And today, Alberta's government is keeping a commitment to help groups protect themselves from hate-motivated crimes. The Alberta Security Infrastructure Program will provide funds to vulnerable community facilities that have experienced or are at risk of being targeted by violence or vandalism. This funding will help to pay for security enhancements to their facilities and to provide training for their staff. We anticipate that important facilities where communities gather will qualify, such as mosques, synagogues, gurdwaras, munders, churches, faith-based schools, and other places that have been or may be targeted for hate crimes. The program is actually modeled on a grant program of the same name, which uh, I helped to establish at the federal level and which has helped to finance security infrastructure for hundreds of faith and other community organizations. Uh, I've seen the effectiveness of this kind of program firsthand which is what inspired me to uh, implement a similar grant here in Alberta. A few years ago, there was an attempted firebombing of the mosque in Gatineau, or Hull, Quebec. As Minister of Multiculturalism, Multiculturalism uh, for the Canadian government, I immediately the next day went and visited the mosque just to express our concern and solidarity. Uh, thankfully, there was very little damage because the uh, blast 
resistant film that had been installed over the windows outside the mosque caused the uh, firebombs to bounce off the windows rather than penetrate into the masjid. And the imam said to me that had it not been for that small security upgrade, he fears that the entire pl uh, masjid may have gone up in flames. So small things like that can make a big difference in keeping communities and places of worship safe. Uh, now, some would think that acts of this kind of violence don't happen in Canada, but last week's mass murder in London was a terrible reminder of how many communities in Canada feel that their day-to-day -day security and safety cannot be taken for granted. So let us be clear. All Albertans, all Albertans must be able to live in a province where it is safe to practice their faith, to exercise their freedom of religion. Albertans must feel safe to walk in their neighborhood and not fear for their safety because of the color of their skin. And this security infrastructure grant program is a concrete demonstration of Alberta's commitment to religious freedom, to public safety, and our shared opposition to the forces of hatred. I would now like to turn the podium over to Minister Madhu, Alberta's Minister of Justice and Solicitor General, uh, to provide more details on the Alberta Security Infrastructure Program. Thank you, uh, Premier. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. When I drove up to this beautiful mosque this morning, I couldn't help but marvel once again at its beauty and the, sp the spirituality it exudes in and out. Sadly, though, it's an unfortunate fact of life that places of worship like this can be targets of hate-motivated crimes, including right here in our province. Vandals painted graffiti on the Bethel Israel Synagogue in 2015. A Calgary Sikh Godwara was vandalized in 2016. And this very mosque we are standing in front of has been a constant target of multiple vandals over the years. Graffiti, property damage, intimidating threats and acts of violence all have serious psychological and physical cost on the people who walk and worship at these facilities. Not to mention its financial cost and its human toll. They should not be asked to bear the cost of preventing such damage all on their own. Through the Alberta Security Infrastructure Program, our government, your government, would help facilitate targeted facilities targeted by hate motivated vandalism, violence, theft, and harassment. Such facilities include places of worship, such as this beautiful mosque, temples, synagogues, godwara, and churches, community centers like indigenous friendship centers and drop-in centers, ceremonial facilities and monuments used by an identifiable group. Grant applicants, will be able to apply to two streams of funding. The first will provide up to $10,000 to complete security assessment and for staff to undergo specialized security training and education. The second will provide up to $90,000 for the purchase and installation of security equipment, such as alarm systems, fences, gates, 
security window film, cameras, motion detectors, and anti-graffiti sealant. The initial grant call will take place in this fall, and we will provide the full details on eligibility and application process in the coming weeks. For now, though, let me say I am very proud uh, to lead the men and women in the Justice Department that takes hate crime and racial violence seriously. That means not just prosecuting these crimes, but doing what is necessary to prevent them from happening. My goal as Justice Minister is to ensure that we prevent them before they occur. But when they do occur, I promise you that they will be thoroughly investigated and we will bring the perpetrators to justice. Because as I have always said, the promise of our province is that it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you worship. It doesn't matter your childhood circumstances, the socioeconomic, religious circumstances of your birth. In this province, we want you to achieve your full potential and live a complete life. Live in peace. Raise your family. Build your businesses. That has always been the promise of our province. And I do want to assure the Muslim community that this government that I am part of is absolutely committed to that. This program and the two hate crime initiative we have announced yesterday, a community liaison and hate crimes coordination unit are a concrete Concrete actions we are taking to help keep all our Albertans safe and protected. In that unit, I have assembled some of the finest and brightest law enforcement, intelligence officials, those we can see and we cannot see, community leaders, to come together to make sure that they are working with your community, all cultural, communities across our province to do everything we can to prevent occurrences such as the one that happened in London, Ontario. My condolences once again to the Muslim community, the Afzal and Salman family, and our prayers for the recovery of the nine-year-old Fayez. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite our next speaker up. Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar rahim I want to begin by, uh, again, giving our condolences to the family in London, the Afzal Salman family. Um, I greet you today, we greet you today with heavy hearts, but we're also inspired by our leadership. I want to thank Honorable Premier Kenny. Honorable Minister of Justice Madhu, the words you spoke this morning um, are ring very true, particularly to the El Rashid community. You talked about the history of the Muslim community in Alberta, how productive and beneficial it has been to this incredible land. Minister Madhu, you talked about the promise of Alberta. You talked about the promise that any child can wake up and dream to be whatever he or she dreams to be. This is a nation in which we encourage that, we foster it, we inculcate it in our textbooks, we inculcate it in our hearts. I grew up in a country where I was told we were a mosaic. And that fabric that you spoke about in Alberta, as we continue to weave that fabric and we tighten and strengthen it, we as Muslim community, we hear the whispers of hate but we are a community that listens to love. Canada is a place of love. And what you're doing today, Honourable Minister and Premier, is an act of love. We heard the words, we've had the sentiments, we've had the hugs, but now there's action. And these security measures, these grants, this hate crimes unit, 
is absolutely necessary. So as we work towards the dream that you speak about, that we speak about, we don't live in that dream. We aspire to that, but we live in reality. And the reality is the Muslim community is under attack. And it's not just the violence, it's the sneers, it's the looks. Our women in our hijab, in their hijabs, are visibly targeted. And it's, it's the small things that add up, that turn into a catastrophe. So we appreciate, Honorable Premier, that you asked other Albertans to reach out and talk to a Muslim. Don't assume. Get to know them. We are part of the landscape. We are the landscape. We, I mean we, not Muslims, I mean we. And it's a place in which I call myself a Canadian, a Canadian Muslim, an Albertan, an Albertan Muslim. I have deep roots in, roots in this province. My family's been coming since the 20s. This mosque is a testament to the beauty of this place. And I say that because in 1938, when Europe was tearing itself apart and was on the brink of a second world war and a genocide against the religious group and others, minorities, Edmonton, Alberta, <laughs> this cold prairie place, was coming together to build a mosque. And it was built not by Muslims only, but by the greater community, the Christian community, the Jewish community, believers, non-believers. We all came together and said, yes, this is a place where everybody should be able to come, reside, and feel comfortable. So on that note, I ask my fellow Canadians that we just be kind to one another. Just be kind. I'd also like to invite everybody this afternoon at 2 p.m. There'll be a moment of prayer and reflection for the lives that were tragically ripped away from us. So if you could please just take a few moments I ask all, everybody, I really do, I'm asking everybody who reaches, this message reaches, just take, just take two seconds and say, is this the Canada we aspire to? God bless you, thank you, and again, we're honored by your presence this morning. Thanks everyone. I think we'll open up for the Q&A. Um, we'll do, as per usual, one question and one follow-up. I'll start with anyone on site today. If you have a question, just approach the microphone over there and uh, just direct us to the question you'd like to ask to whom. I, I suppose it would be for Minister Madhu first. Uh, just uh, hoping for a few more details about the program itself. Um, sounds like about $100,000 maybe per organization. Maybe talk about, about how the money is being this will, will be distributed. Is it a straight up grant program or is there matching funds? There is absolutely no matching uh, fund. This is a straight up grant of $100,000. This year alone, it will be $500,000 because we are half, almost half to the year. The year after, it will be a million dollars. And as I said, I am very committed. If the needs for more resources are there, if we find we need more than a million dollars, a year. You can be rest assured that we would uh, make sure that the adequate resources are there to fund this important grant and security infrastructure program. Follow up? Uh, and, and just, uh, you know, with the announcement of, of all three of these measures, um, how do you see them all working together and, and what are you looking to see as far as change in Alberta as a result of this? You know, as I said in my remarks, we are a province that welcomes everyone. And this is a province of dreams, where you can come to and achieve your dreams and live a full life. The goal of this program, and they have been carefully developed to work together. First, we are going to ensure we protect religious cultural facilities across our province. Second, we have appointed, we are, I am going to uh, appoint a community liaison that is going to work with communities like this and other cultural communities across our province and also work with intelligence and law enforcement community and to make sure that we are keeping an eye on what is going on in our various communities 
but with a focus on those communities where we see increasing incidence of hate crime. And third, this particular unit have brought together the finest of our law enforcement intelligence community. As I said, um, they are going to work closely with communities, with uh, religious groups, with cultural groups, with community leaders, uh, to make sure that uh, we are on top of uh, issues like this before they occur. But when they do occur, I have strengthened, you know, um, in, I have created a specialized investigation and prosecution unit within this hate crime unit so that um, when, they do, when hate motivated violence do occur, that we are making sure that they are thoroughly investigated and that justice is done. Thank you, Minister Madhu. Uh, next question, if you could just introduce yourself and your outlet as well, thanks. It's Carly Robinson with City News. Hi, Carly. Um, uh, for the minister, you talked a little bit about prosecuting hate crimes when they do happen. Those in the law enforcement community often talk about how hard it is to lay a hate crime charge, <clears throat> even when something you can see is very hateful and causes harm to the community. I was hoping to get your perspective on what needs to be done to be able to fully prosecute these crimes. You know, great question, Kelly. As you know, hate crimes are... Um, provided for in the Criminal Code of Canada. We do have the laws. The laws are there in the Criminal Code. If I think the laws are not there in the Criminal Code, I would uh, be thinking of legislating something that would obviously meet the threshold of our Constitution. But the laws are there. The problem is with respect to investigations and being able to ensure that what we call the, in law the mens rea, in other words, the intentions, uh, are approved in court. And the best way to tackle that is what I have done with this specialized investigation and prosecution unit that would pay special attention to incidents of hate. So these fine men and women will be dedicated to investigating matters of this particular nature. If we have thorough investigation, dedicated law enforcement and intelligence officials, I can guarantee that we will be successful in persecuting them, and that's what I'm looking forward to do. But at the end of the day, I would see the type of result uh, we get from when once this kick off, and that would tell us whether or not we need to do more. But for now, I do think that we've got the right mix of programs and capacity in place. Follow-up, Carly? Yeah, Follow-up would be for Premier uh, Jason Kenney. Um, we heard in the opening prayer about some of the, the factors that bring this hate. We heard about um, colonialism, white supremacy. I'm wondering what needs to be done to fully uh, <laughs> attack the root cause of this hate in our province, which is potentially cultural, and uh, what needs to be done? Thank you for the good question. I had, I've had many years to reflect on that because I served as Canada's uh, Minister for Multiculturalism for 10 years and Minister of Immigration for five years, uh, during which time we welcomed uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, new Canadians of the, of the Muslim faith. And I visited with every different faith and cultural community in the country I concluded that the single most powerful uh, weapon against hatred is simply relationships. We can have all sorts of programs. We can put posters in the schools and, and we can run ads condemning hatred, but I don't think those things are, tip are very effective at changing a person's heart. Hatred comes from the heart. The most effective way of changing someone's heart from hatred to respect to love is through relationships, which is why I put out a call today and earlier this week for Albertans to intentionally reach out to Muslims that might be on the margins of their life that they may not know personally, but to make a point to get to know them. Uh, because once you get to know a person, their story, their family, their aspirations, uh, you can no longer objectify them in some kind of identity category or box. 
I think that's very important. We've got to get beyond uh, thinking in terms of ethnic and religious categories and boxes and get to know each other as human beings. So one of the programs that I implemented federally was uh, through the Multiculturalism Department was what we called the, um, uh, it was a program to, to match communities, particularly communities that may have had a history of conflict, of people of Tamil and Sinhalese origin, of uh, people of Israeli and Palestinian origin, uh, people of uh, uh, Muslim and, and Sikh origin from South Asia, and other communities that had had perhaps a history of conflict, but also for uh, Canadians who had not really had a direct personal exposure. So, and particularly to younger Canadians. So I think that's the key. It's, it's, it, this, it has to be a matter of the heart to defeat this kind of hatred. Um, I can only imagine that this twisted individual responsible allegedly for this gross hate crime in London um, was uh, never developed a normal, friendly, personal relationship with a Canadian Muslim. Um, of course, another thing that we have to address, all of us, is uh, hatred on the internet because um, so much of these bigoted attitudes are uh, I think excel are, are amplified by um, crazy and hateful corners of the internet. And, 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 and so often we see the perpetrators of crimes like these get sunk into a silo of, of uh, twisted ideas online. So I, I do hope and I expect that uh, the stepped up hate crimes uh, policing effort that the minister has announced will focus in part on that. We'll now go to the phones. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Michael King, Global News. Hi there, for the Premier. Uh, what's your concern and uh, how is the Delta variant being factored in when it comes to reopening since it's seemingly changing the game in terms of infecting people with one or even two vaccine doses? Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'll just, first of all, point out that uh, Dr. Hinshaw has been asked about that a, a number of times recently, and, and she has uh, confirmed that... Uh, um, she was asked about this and said that case numbers, for example, uh, in the United Kingdom right now in the last couple of weeks are trending in the wrong direction, and a lot of that seems to be driven by the Delta variant, um, and that's a country that's well ahead of us when it comes to second dose administered. So given how little, as the previous reports have mentioned, when it comes to uh, X percentage of just one dose when a country that's way ahead of us... Uh, why? Actually, the quote here is too long. Let me just, I'm sorry, summarize. Um, We've had the Delta variant in Alberta since April 9. And as of yesterday, I think we were reporting uh, just over 100 active cases. So it, it does not appear to be uh, growing at an alarming rate to date. Um, secondly, it's really, as always, a question of a race between vaccines and variants. And we think we're well ahead in the race with the, uh, the vaccines winning. Um, the... Uh, the, the real concern about Delta is emerging from the United Kingdom. Um, but what we see there is that the spread is happening primarily amongst younger people, teenagers and 20-somethings, who um, had not been vaccinated. The United Kingdom didn't start vaccinating people under 30 until just in the past week or so. So they had a huge segment of the population that tends to mix with each other socially that were totally unvaccinated, not even first dose coverage. Um, and in cer certain uh, cities in northern England, um, the, the uh, travelers had come back from, from South Asia uh, with the, um, the Delta variant, uh, and it began to circulate in, in younger cohorts in those particular communities. But it has not resulted in a measurable increase in hospitalizations in the UK, so there appears to be no significant additional hospital pressure in Britain. What we have different here is that we did, we went faster and broader in our population rollout of the first dose vaccines. So everyone from 12 and up is at least 50% uh, covered in every age category. So we don't have an entire age category that is unprotected. Um, 
so uh, we, we already have better protection right across the age spectrum. Uh, and in fact, we have higher first dose coverage now than the United Kingdom does. They're at about 62% and we're closing in on 68% here in Alberta. So um, what we actually see in the data is the numbers continue to come down. You'll see that in, in, today, in today's report. Uh, our positivity rate has come down. The rate of transmission has consistently been below one now for, for uh, the better part of a month. Uh, the hospital pressure is abating. We're now below 100 in ICUs. Uh, we'll, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this week we're below 300 on total hospitalizations. So um, we, we have the, the hospital capacity. We continue to roll out the vaccines. And uh, we have to keep an eye on this. But um, I, I, I am confident, as is Dr. Hinshaw, that with the breadth of vaccine rollout, uh, that, that we are going to uh, be able to, to prevent negative health outcomes uh, from, from the Delta variant. And do you have a brief follow-up, Michael? Yeah, just with Hinshaw, uh, Dr. Hinshaw saying that she's going to be away for the week. Uh, any concerns in terms of messaging, especially when it comes to getting uh, people out for their first and then second doses? Uh, any plans for the province besides just the online updates um, to make sure that this message gets, since we're at such a pivotal point here, uh, gets uh, conveyed as clearly as possible? Sure. Well, uh, let me just say that after 16, 17 months of working 100-hour weeks, I think uh, Dr. Hinshaw deserves a, a few days off with her family. And so I, I hope she has a good, I hope she has a good uh, break. And um, she'll be, uh, we'll have be the involvement of her senior officials from public health in the news conferences uh, next week. Uh, and I'm sure if any, anything that's really an emergency arrives, uh, arises, we can consult with Dr. Hinshaw. But she has a great team and, and they'll be uh, working with the Minister of Health and the Emergency Management Cabinet Committee. Uh, we will be making an announcement in the next few days about additional efforts to promote and perhaps even incentivize vaccination. As you know, the first growth demand has slowed a bit, which is frustrating. Uh, but uh, we we just want Albert, like we, we're so close to that 70% threshold of, of first dose uh, coverage and, and population protection. Uh, but, you know, we've only been growing at about 0.2, 0.3% of population recently. I want to remind people that if they were vaccinated outside of the country, like many of our snowbirds were, they can now uh, drop by an AHS office and pre present the paperwork and be counted in our system as having been protected. Uh, and I think yesterday uh, we incorporated into our uh, count uh, the Canadian Armed Forces personnel, including those here at CFB Nemeo, um, who have been vaccinated through the federal system. So we're getting there. We, I, I, I believe we will hit the 70% mark next week, but we want to keep growing, of course, uh, to, uh, to 80 and above if possible. All right, we have time for and, two. And I should, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, uh, Jerrica, just to add that uh, we are also stepping up our promotional efforts. Uh, there will be a mailer going to every Alberta household. I believe it'll be hitting doorsteps next week. And it will specifically address a lot of the misinformation and misconceptions about the vaccines and their safety. So we're going to be taking that head on. And uh, we're also stepping up our ad campaigns in targeted ways. Thanks, Taylor. So we have time for two more questions. Operator, can you please put through our second last caller? Janet French, CBC. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. I'm so sorry, I missed the name of the person who spoke after Minister Badu, but I was hoping that you could tell us, um, just on, on touching on Carly's question about um, preventing people from developing racist attitudes in the first place, what do you think would be the most effective ways, you know, financial investment required or not, to prevent people from, from developing those kinds of uh, attitudes? I think uh, uh, any kind of, a, of a, a program, it doesn't have to be a program, it just has to be normal relations. Like, it, it was mentioned that this mosque was built in 1938, primarily by um, Canadians uh, of Lebanese origin, uh, uh, Muslim Canadians of Lebanese origin, but it was built with the assistance of the Jewish and Lebanese Christian communities at the time. Imagine that. Um, and they didn't need a government program to get, or government funding to get them to do that. It was the community coming together. And that's the Alberta spirit. It, we, we don't need government to bring people together. May, we can play a facilitative role and, um, and can and should, 
but it, it's really about individuals reaching out to each other, just as they did in 1938. In a world where there was a lot more division, uh, I, 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 so I, I think this is something that's got to come organically, naturally, from the community. And uh, if you, I, my message to people, if you were moved, touched, devastated by the violence in London this week, that do something very simple about it. There must be a, a Muslim family somewhere in your sphere, uh, in your community, in, in your workplace. Just give them a call. I encouraged all of our MLAs the other day. Uh, they, know, they all know Muslims in their communities. I said, you know, why don't you spend part of the weekend just picking up the phone and impromptu calls to meet people in the community, just to check in, see how they're doing, express concern. Uh, that, that kind of informal outreach, it, it's not, you know, government can set a tone and call for it, but it's ultimately got to come from the community. And I, I think that's a very Alberta thing to do. Did you have a follow-up, Janet? Uh, yeah, sorry, perhaps I wasn't clear. That I'm sorry. was a question for the man oh. who spoke after no, Minister Badu. I apologize. Did, did you know that? I didn't understand that. Go ahead. I was waiting patiently. He's way more articulate than me. I don't know about that, but thank Please. you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, no, thank you for the question. It's a great question. I mean, I'm going to pick up on what uh, Premier Kennedy said. You know, relationships are huge. Um, they're huge. You got, we got to talk to one each other. We got to want for each other what we want for ourselves, you know. Um, it's good advice. I think Christ came up with it. <laughs> um, I'll also say that I will challenge the notion of it's important that it's organic because love has to be authentic. Respect has to be authentic. But I mentioned in my speech, I grew up in a country in which as a little kid, third, fourth grade, we were taught this beautiful idea of a mosaic, a cultural mosaic. And that, you know, Canada is a dream. It's where we are Canadian, but we can celebrate our differences. And I mean celebrate. So, you know, I grew up eating Korean kimchi. I ate roti. I mean, I, I, and I went to a school in which everybody was equal. Yeah, we all had our challenges, but no kid wasn't getting the same answer to two plus two. Because it was all equal. Math is equal. Two plus two is four for everybody. Color, religion, belief. So... The idea that you can couple that logic with we're equal as human beings under the law is an extraordinary idea. It's not, it's not it practiced everywhere in the world. It's practiced in very few places. And Canada is exceptional. It's an exceptional place. And it's dear. And it's meaningful. And it's important. And Canada was cracked in London, Ontario. It was cracked. But we'll repair it because we're people of good. And I want to say that, you know, I have so much faith in my fellow Albertans. I have so much faith in the people around me. I have so much pay faith in the people that play soccer with my children or play tennis or go to school with them that I'm not worried. We are, we are, we are on our heels, absolutely. But we're not worried because we know the goodness of this place. We've experienced for over a century. Canada has its crimes. It has its blemishes but it's moving towards goodness. And I think that can be done through, honestly, trusting one another and a really good education at a very young age. My name is Amr Asif. I am, it's spelled A-U-M-E-R-A-S-S-A-F. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to our last caller. Operator, can you please put through our last caller? Charlotte Gamulin, Radio Canada. Oui, bonjour. Mes deux questions vont être pour euh, Monsieur Kenny, s'il vous plaît. Euh, D'abord, Monsieur Kenny, pourquoi vous en êtes rendu maintenant à penser qu'il faut encourager les gens, les Albertains, à avoir un vaccin avec une loterie ou des incitatifs? Oui, nous pensons sérieusement à une telle loterie pour euh, créer un incitatif euh, d'obtenir le vaccin. Uh, uh, il y aura des nouvelles à cet égard prochainement, mais uh, ne retardez pas parce que tout le monde qui ont été déjà vacciné uh, sera inclus dans une uh, loterie potentielle. Nous avons vu dans certains États aux États-Unis uh, que ces loteries étaient très uh, efficaces 
euh, en augmentant le nombre des personnes qui ont obtenu les vaccins. Euh, écoutez, euh, on a vu une diminution euh, considérable dans la demande pour les, les premières doses des vaccins dans les deux, trois dernières semaines. Alors, euh, il faut, il y a un certain nombre de personnes qui sont euh, peut-être euh, ouvertes à l'idée de vaccination, mais il, il faut avoir un, un petit euh, encouragement. Alors, nous considérons toutes sortes d'idées euh, de faire cet encouragement, y, y compris potentiellement une loterie. And do you have a follow-up, Charlotte? Oui, euh, c'est pour le sujet de la conférence de presse. Euh, Monsieur Kenny, 500 000 euh, que vous allez donner, ce n'est pas beaucoup pour tous les organismes et les lieux de culte qui peuvent se sentir à risque dans la province. Comment pensez-vous que ça va vraiment faire une différence pour eux? Ça sera un programme de, de au moins un million de dollars par année, euh, mais maintenant nous sommes déjà à moitié, euh, à moitié de l'année à passer. Mais on va l'augmenter s'il y a euh, une demande importante. C'est le début. C'est effectivement un pilote, euh, pro, un programme pilote. Euh, mais 100 000 dollars, c'est une subvention assez importante, je dirais, pour les, les installations communautaires de se protéger. Je l'ai vu moi-même au fédéral. Effectivement, ce programme est plus généreux du programme euh, pareil au fédéral parce que celui-là, il faut que les communautés, comme le mosquée, euh, donne 50 des fonds. C'est un programme par année, 50-50 Mais ici, le, le programme de l'Alberta est 100 des subventions gouvernementales. Et euh, alors, c'est plus généreux à, à cet égard. Mais on, on va lancer le programme, on va voir euh, la mesure du demande. Et comme j'ai dit, s'il si faut l'augmenter, les fonds disponibles, nous le ferons. Oh, sure. Yeah, not bad. I didn't know he spoke French. So the question was about the funding. And I, I well, the first question was about uh, lotteries uh, for, for vaccines. And I said that we are seriously considering something like that in Alberta to incentivize people who have been maybe a bit reluctant to date to get vaccinated. Um, every COVID patient costs our system uh, nearly a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, so if we were to uh, put a bit of money out there as an incentive, it would easily save us in the long run in terms of, um, preventing uh, COVID-related health care costs. Uh, and we are looking very closely at the experience of a bunch of U.S. states, which uh, have seen significant upticks in vaccine demand as a result of lotteries and other incentives. So just stay tuned uh, as we consider that. On the other, I was also asked about um, the, the funds, whether, uh, whether the half million dollars this year is sufficient. And echoing the minister, I said that um, that first of all, this program is more generous than the federal counterpart program because the federal program is 50-50 cost shared. So the community would have to raise 50 grand to, in order to get the benefit of that uh, subsidy. This is a 100% government uh, program, recognizing that many of these communities are really far stretched charities and nonprofits to start with. And, uh, and secondly, as the minister said, we're, we're starting with half a million this year just because we're halfway through the year. And it, at this stage, it is a bit of a pilot. Uh, but if the demand runs much stronger than the funds that we have budgeted, then we will we'll find additional resources. We'll, um, uh, we'll expand the program uh, if the demand is adequate. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you especially to everyone from Al-Rashid uh, for welcoming us.